Salutations! Today begins our analysis of The God Delusion by Professor Richard Dawkins, a renowned evolutionary biologist and an infamous critic of religion. Before we start, I would like to say that during my years as a proud skeptic and an admirer of the learned professor, at no point did I ever actually read through this book. Now I wish that I had, as it might have sped me along my course away from such notions. Anyhow, let us dive right into the book. To begin the preface, Professor Dawkins expounds his belief that a significant proportion of people are religious simply because they were raised that way and are unaware that they have the option to renounce it, and that when presented with atheism they are generally inclined to shed the shackles of faith. It is highly conspicuous that the learned professor makes absolutely no mention of the vast swathes of people who were raised in one religion and subsequently converted to another, or those like myself who were raised with no religion whatsoever, who having lived as ardent materialists for years, upon investigating the fundamental principles of their own system of thought, have discovered them to be riddled with innumerable stupid opinions. He then lists off various bad things that certain religious people have done and still do, which as a rhetorical tool might be effective, but without a rigid model within which to analyse this, it has absolutely no bearing on whether or not the beliefs of those people are actually true. Notably, every drop of blood he invokes is on the hands of the god of Abraham alone, and serves only to bolster the conviction of those who consider these impious Galileans, as it were, to be opposed to genuine religion. If anyone wants to see the extreme ridiculousness of Professor Dawkins' attachment of exceptional cruelty or barbarism to the religious mind, I recommend they search terms like Gulag Archipelago, Black Book of Communism, Great Purge, Holodomor, Cultural Revolution, and Cambodian Genocide into their search engine of choice. Professor Dawkins then presents us with this absolute gem. I want everybody to flinch whenever we hear a phrase such as Catholic child or Muslim child. Speak of a child of Catholic parents if you like, but if you hear anybody speak of a Catholic child, stop them and politely point out that children are too young to know where they stand on such issues, just as they are too young to know where they stand on economics or politics. Not only is this unadulterated cringe, it's also anti-scientific. Just like anyone else, a child thinks that some things are true and some things are not. You can put a brain scanner on a child and ask them questions about religion and get responses just as clear as those of an adult. This seems like irrelevant nitpicking as it's not a real part of Dawkins' arguments, but I chose to put focus on this bit for a reason. It demonstrates that the state of mind with which Professor Dawkins is approaching the subject is not one of scientific analysis, it is one of ideology that is informed largely by his own personal feelings and experiences, ironically being strongly informed by the culture in which he was raised further showing that he is not applying his own analytical standards to himself. But let's move on. Being an atheist is nothing to be apologetic about. On the contrary, it is something to be proud of, standing tall to face the far horizon, for atheism nearly always indicates a healthy independence of mind, and indeed a healthy mind. <laughs> oh by Jove, that was gold. On an unrelated note, did you know that using magnetic fields to shut down the posterior medial frontal cortex, part of the brain associated with problem solving, causes religious belief to decrease? I'll put a link in the description to an article about it. Right, let's keep going. Professor Dawkins then makes what, if it were part of an argument, I would call an appeal to authority, by invoking John Stuart Mill with a quote that he seems to think profound. The world would be astonished if it knew how great a proportion of its brightest ornaments, of those most distinguished even in popular estimation for wisdom and virtue, are complete sceptics in religion. I wonder how many of those people happen to be on the autism spectrum. According to a paper I will link in the description, autism and associated conditions are strongly correlated with an improvement in certain specialised cognitive abilities, and also with a lack of religious belief. Finally, we will close the preface with a summary of his intent. If this book works as I intend, religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. What presumptuous optimism! I, perhaps more presumptuously, would call it pessimism to think that one who knows the mysteries might be persuaded by the content of this book. Now we will proceed to the first chapter. Chapter 1 begins with an anecdote about an Anglican priest who was inspired to don the cloth by a childhood experience of the grand beauty of the universe. Dawkins then reveals that he also had a comparable experience, which inspired him instead to pursue science. 
The purpose of this anecdotal comparison is not altogether explicit, but it appears to be an attempt to present a passion for science and for religion as antithetical responses to a common stimulus. This is a fantastical construction of the learned professor's own imagination. If we take a look at reality, we see that the natural philosophers of the ancient world who spent their days performing experiments, constructing elaborate devices, studying mathematics and geometry, pondering the motions of the stars and the inner workings of organisms, were the very same philosophers who made discourse on the natures, energies and essences of the gods themselves. That is to say nothing of the mountains of scientific projects sponsored by the Catholic Church, and of the vast legions of priests, astrologers, alchemists, and occultists who have made scientific and mathematical discoveries, that Isaac Newton was an esoteric alchemist. Not one of these people has considered the mystical and the metaphysical to be in any way opposed to the scientific. The preference for one over the other is no more confrontational than an artist's preference for sculpture over painting. The professor then proceeds to quote Carl Sagan, how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought, the universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead they say, no, 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 my god is a little god, and I want him to stay that way. Every single thing about this quote is so phenomenally wrong that I could dedicate an entire video to this alone. Why on earth anyone would defer to Carl Sagan on the subject of history or religion is alone astounding. He knew absolutely nothing about these topics to the point that the final episode of his series Cosmos has been relentlessly mocked by historians. I've left a link in the description to an article going over just how incredibly wrong almost everything he said in that episode was. Needless to say, a simple glance at the works of Iamblichus or Proclus will reveal the immense grandeur, subtlety and elegance with which the ancients comprehended the cosmos. I am not aware of a single fact known today, but unknown in the past, that does not integrate harmoniously with the general worldview of the ancients. The rejection of certain scientific discoveries is exclusive and peculiar to the Abrahamic religions, and even then it was generally exceptional even among them. Do you seriously imagine that Aristotle, placed in a room with Newton, would declare him a heretic? That Plotinus, being shown distant galaxies through a telescope, would think them the conjurations of Goetists? No, this is a gross mischaracterization with absolutely no basis in reality. Commenting further on Sagan, he proceeds thus. All Sagan's books touch the nerve endings of transcendent wonder that religion monopolized in past centuries. My own books have the same aspiration. Um. No? Dawkins here is conflating several distinct experiences obscurely, when it is quite evident that he is unfamiliar with at least one of them. What he is primarily referring to is what I would call awe, the tingling sensation that arises like an invisible fire upon beholding something very beautiful and unconsciously contrasting it with the self. This is very common, as an atheist I encountered it many times when listening to music or seeing certain old architecture that in hindsight seems to have been designed specifically for the purpose. I doubt that anyone in history would have attributed this feeling exclusively to religion. In fact, Sappho describes it wonderfully in her poem designated Sappho 31 in the context of love. For when I look at you even for a short time, it is no longer possible for me to speak but it is as if my tongue is broken, and immediately a subtle fire has run over my skin. I cannot see anything with my eyes, and my ears are buzzing." So on that account alone he is very wrong, but this goes much further. There are many states of frenzy or altered consciousness that descend upon us, and awe is the least among them, passing over both the Fura Poeticus and the Fura Teutonicus, for they require much background to speak on, I will bring in something thematically appropriate to this chapter, the experience of unity. This is a state of mind in which the boundary between oneself and everything else seems to be obliterated, such that the subject cannot even determine what is himself and what is the world. This is accompanied by a sort of bliss. I will not go into the platonic explanation of the metaphysical nature of this phenomenon here, but I will say that so far as I am aware, there are only two contexts in which this experience is possible. The first is under the influence of psychedelic drugs, and the other is when undergoing certain thergic rituals. But this again is nothing compared to what I will call the hierophany after Eliade. I regret that I barely possess the vocabulary to begin to describe it, 
as it is entirely unlike any other way of being that I have ever come across or seen any reference to. The best I can produce is a rough analogy. It is like stepping outside of time, and all that beauty and wonder and grandeur of the universe fades away like shadows in the face of a light so intense that the sun would seem like the tiniest spark against that roaring fire. Suddenly you see everything you thought was real and solid is nothing but a vapour that ebbs and flows, while you stand among true, real, objective and universal powers. It is Plato's cave as a lived experience. In any case, I am not familiar with any instance of an atheist contemplating the beauty of space to have been driven into a hysteria of shrieking and howling in uncontrollable ecstasy as if possessed. The Professor then draws the distinction between those who invoke the name of God as an abstract but are in reality materialists, and those who believe in, to quote, a supernatural creator that is appropriate for us to worship. This is a definition that I'm generally happy with, although I consider the term creator questionable unless it is taken in the broadest possible sense. Dawkins points to those of the latter sort who conflate the former's poetics with their own conceptions in order to claim them. So far as I'm concerned, Professor Dawkins can keep them, we have our own. He then defines naturalism in the sense that it is generally understood, and goes on to explain that there are many who believe in belief, and identify with one or another religion without holding any actual beliefs in anything beyond the physical, and that these are in fact atheists. None of this is in any way objectionable, so we can skip past this section. Professor Dawkins brings up this quote from a Catholic clergyman, some men think that because they have achieved a high degree of learning in some field, they are qualified to express opinions in all. And this is certainly something I think a lot of people today can find parallels for. In university, it was something I encountered regularly, with the further parallel that these extra-professional opinions, when noted by myself, invariably turned out to be wrong or grotesquely oversimplified. The learned professor, in the most astounding and deeply disappointing display of ignorance I hope I shall ever see from someone so familiar with public misunderstanding of his own field of expertise, proceeds thusly. The notion that religion is a proper field in which one might claim expertise is one that should not go unquestioned. That clergyman presumably would not have deferred to the expertise of a claimed fairyologist on the exact shape and colour of fairy wings. When I first settled on Platonism as the soundest response I could find to the problems I saw in my own prior thinking, I took immediately to reading the Enneads of Plotinus. I thought I had understood them, and moved on to Iamblichus. After reading the first six pages of De Mysteris, I stopped. I could not understand a single thing Iamblichus had said. I was like a barely literate child staring with glazed over eyes at a university textbook. After carefully reading the works of Gregory Shaw, Thomas Taylor, Radek Chlup and Stephen R. L. Clarke, I have only recently begun to grasp the complexity and subtlety of Iamblichus' work. I now look back at the Enneads and realise that I had not understood them either. I hope my point has been conveyed appropriately. As for fairies, Professor Dawkins seems to be bizarrely ignorant that folklorist is a profession that requires enormous, meticulous study in which to achieve competence. The professor's remark is derisive and insulting to a respected academic field. It is at this point of the book, I should like to add, that I believe I would have changed the course of my mental development away from these stupid opinions had I read it years ago. The professor begins this next section by decrying the general refusal to engage with the topic of religion in a discursive manner, quoting the comedy writer Douglas Adams, with which I entirely agree. Matters of such tremendous importance as religion ought to be considered with as much care and discernment as possible, never to be bogged down with fear of offence. If, for example, the Christians happen to be right and refusing to accept Jesus Christ constitutes a one-way ticket to Gehenna, then refusing to engage with heretics on religion out of respect for their personal faith would be a display of horrendous cruelty and malice. I am certain that if these same people who refuse to criticise religion happened to encounter an esoteric Hitlerist who considered Adolf Hitler to be a manifestation of God on Earth, they would drop all their pretensions like so much hot coal. Dawkins points to several examples from the United States of laws and regulations applied strongly across the board being suddenly ignored on the basis of the offender's religion, namely conscientious objection to military service, the use of mind-altering drugs, and discriminatory interpersonal behaviour. Whatever your thoughts on these issues generally, 
Anyone with the capacity to think critically will agree with Professor Dawkins that rules should not be suspended on the basis of the rule breaker's opinions. The chapter ends with a description of the horrific events that followed the publishing of some cartoons. And by the way, I'm talking about Denmark, not France. As for the titanic disease with which the perpetrators of such crimes are infected, I will say only that the fate prescribed for its progenitor by Dante Alighieri is far too kind. Well, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.